Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Member of Parliament, Mr. Virendra Sharma, uh, Dr. Rajan, Professor Tillon, friends, and all the attendees here, welcome to King's College London. Uh, we, we invite you on behalf of the King's India Institute and the National Indian Students and Alumni Union UK. My name is Vignesh, and I'm a doctoral researcher at King's India Institute, and I head the research and thought leadership wing at NISA. And I thank you all for joining us for a special evening with our very special guest. May I have a round of applause for the one and only Dr. Jagran Martin. We've had the honor of hosting Dr. Rajan as our last major public event just before the pandemic hit. And it's quite special that for the second of our major events, once we've returned to normalcy, we have the privilege of hosting Dr. Rajan again. Speaking of the pandemic, I request everyone to follow COVID-19 protocol given the recent surge in crash cases. We have gathered today to discuss something of fundamental importance. Dr. Rajan's keynote today will be on the topic why liberal democracy is needed for India's economic development. Democracy is arguably the most vital form of government, yet worldwide there are serious concerns owing to global developments in the recent decades. Our conversation today will focus on the link between liberal democracy and economic development in the case of India. As we stand at this remarkable juncture, celebrating 75 years of our great country's independence, it's a moment of critical reflection for all of us. We love our country, and it is that love that makes us want our country to grow comprehensively. Therefore, at NISA, it is important for us young Indians to have these conversations with stalwarts as Dr. Rajan, so that we can learn imagine and work towards shaping the India of our dreams. Today's event is hosted as a part of the multi-year cross-disciplinary research project to study UK-India trade, which is led by Dr. Sunil Mitra Kumar and Dr. Kamini Gupta at the King's India Institute. Dr. Gupta is an assistant professor at the King's Business School, and her award-winning research lies at the intersection of business and society, and she has a special interest in social issues in India. Dr. Kumar's research focuses on the questions of causal inference in the context of development using observational data on individuals, households, and small firms. And he is the senior lecturer in economics at the King's India Institute, which is hosting the event tonight. King's India Institute, led by our formidable and committed Dr. Louis Stillen, is world-leading center for multidisciplinary research, teaching, and public engagement on contemporary India and South Asia. Through our work, the KII fosters understanding of India's political, social, and economic life, and its role as a global actor. The King's India Institute has celebrated its 10th anniversary this year. Speaking of anniversaries, it's NISAO's 10th year as well, and we are the oldest and the largest national body representing students and youth of Indian origin in the UK. We were set up 10 years ago because we found that there was no home away from home for the thousands of Indian students who came to the UK to study. I was fortunate then to be a part of the founding team of NISAO, and I'm privileged now to be continuing to work today. An entirely voluntary initiative, we work day in and day out to help students, alumni, with any help that they need. We ran a seven plus year long campaign to bring back the post-study work visa in the UK. Dr. Sharma and a whole bunch of, Mr. Sharma and a whole bunch of them was helpful in this pursuit. And now we have the post-study work visa. Uh, we've helped the Indian government in the Vande Bharat mission and also extended our help to, to people stuck in Ukraine thereby making our work cross-border. Uh, some of the volunteers that you see today played a critical role in this activity. And now I hand over and invite Dr. Kumar to please introduce our speaker and kick off the proceedings. Thanks a lot, Vignesh. Um, friends, good evening. It is my supreme privilege and uh, pleasure to be able to welcome you to this lecture um, by Professor Raghuram Rajan. Um, as Vignesh mentioned, um, this is on behalf of King's College London and my department, the King's India Institute, in collaboration with NISAO. And in particular, I'm delighted to be doing this as part of a three-year pro project on key enablers and obstacles to UK-India trade, jointly with my colleague Kamini Gupta over there from the King's Business School. I am Bangalore um, and Fikki 
UK. Um, now, of course, trade is a more specific topic, and in the context of UK, India, it becomes yet more specific, um, but clearly economic development determinants thereof, and above all, liberal democracy, are crucial themes in shaping that, that overall picture. Um, Professor Rajan, our speaker this evening, as most of you know, is Distinguished Service Professor of Finance. Catherine Dusak miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance, apologies, at the Booth School at University of Chicago. He has served at the IMF as Chief Economist and Director of Research from 2003 to 6. He served on the board of the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, as Vice Chair, 2015-16. And to those of us who are keenly interested and follow India's economic, political, and overall trajectory, he is perhaps best known as Governor of the Reserve Bank of India uh, between 2013 and 2016. Professor Rajan is a scholar of finance in the widest possible sense, where the word finance connotes, of course, finance itself, but capital more generally, and questions about capitalism and the capitalist system as a whole. Um, he studies the ways in which finance therefore shapes the economy and economic growth, the role of banks, and in particular, the role of central banks. And here's where it gets interesting and very distinctive in that not only does he study what we could term core monetary stability functions of those banks, but also what happens because of the relationship between the political establishment and the aims of that political establishment and governance and so-called textbook aims of central banks, and therefore how central banks can sometimes get stretched into doing what we might call non-core functions, or might pay more attention to those non-core functions than to their core functions. Now, this range of topics clearly spans micro to macro, and it goes broader still, um, in that insights into economies and the capitalist system as a whole is something that Professor Rajan has researched, and what is needed to make that system work for everyone. So yes, he's distinctive and very insightful, but there's one more thing. He is scarily prescient. As most of you know, in 2005, he delivered a keynote address in which he spoke about something very minor, namely financial intermediaries, managers who lie between investors and investments, and the fact that the low probabilities of risk assigned to the implications of their actions might actually be an underestimate. And the collective nature of the behavior of these managers, intermediaries, might lead to huge events and cataclysmic risk of exactly the kind which then unfolded in the global financial crisis. More recently, uh, another speech, late 2021, Professor Rajan speaks about what has happened in the wake of the great financial crisis, that central banks, not under pressure anymore to worry about inflation, because inflation has been very low, um, and historically amazingly low, being dragged into larger questions of what needs to be done to reflate the economy and how to strengthen growth. And in that sense, they have gone a little bit overboard. And he speaks as of November 2021 and says, there is therefore a risk that inflation might become a big problem. It's July 2022. What are we all talking about in all corners of the world? So all I'd like to conclude by saying is a very warm welcome to Professor Rajan and to all of you. He will be speaking about liberal democracy and India's economic development. In light of what he says, in terms of scarily prescient, listen very carefully. Is the mic here? Yes, Dr. Rajan, I will. Okay. Can you hear me back there? Great. Um, well, thank you very much to Nisal for uh, organizing this. And uh, of course, uh, thanks all of you for being here. Um, now, the topic uh, uh, is uh, why liberal democracy is necessary for Indian development. And so immediately, uh, you must ask, who am I to speak on all this? I am certainly am not a political scientist. Some would say I'm not even an economist. Uh, but, but I have the benefit of seeing political economy play out, uh, both in policy making in India and across the world. And I think 
as an observer, I have uh, some experience to talk about what I see going on. And the point I want to make in this talk is there is an argument that democracy holds back growth in, and development in India, and so what we need is a strong leader and an authoritarian leadership with few checks and balances on it. And certainly India seems to be drifting in this direction, and there are many who applaud it, including people outside India. I believe this argument is totally misguided because it's based on an outdated model of development. And I would argue that uh, instead, India's future will be based on how it can make its liberal democracy and its institutions. Uh, and if it can do that, I think its future is limitless. If it doesn't, I think it's much bleaker. Now, I'm going to make this argument based on the economics, because I want to make the point that it is in India's self-interest to strengthen rather than weaken liberal democracy. It's not just a concern of Leuchten's Delhi that we need democracy. It's a much larger concern. But I don't want to just leave it at self-interest. I want to say, in, 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 you know, as we start, that if we allow our democracy to crumble into majoritarianism or authoritarianism, it's not just our economic future which is jeopardized, it's our, our soul as a nation and our place in the community of democratic nations. It's a moral imperative for us to not do it, but let me put the morality aside and talk about the economics, because at least for a lot of people, uh, the economics makes direct sense. Now, to make this point, again, can you hear me back there? Stop me if you can't. India is certainly rebounding today, and uh, you know we, we keep saying we're the fastest growing large economy in the world, and that's right. Of course, with bouncing back from a pretty catastrophic uh, pandemic and growth rates which were quite miserable at that time, and, of course, the war in Ukraine, inflation and rising interest rates, like everywhere else, are casting a shadow. But we also must recognize that the last few years have been quite bad for our poorest citizens, especially our youngest citizens, uh, the children who have suffered during the pandemic and continue to suffer with a K-shaped recovery. I believe the scarring of India's lower middle class households and its small and medium enterprises, we haven't seen the full effects so far, but we will see the effects over time. And that means any rebound will remain somewhat subdued after the initial strong rebound from the lows of the pandemic. Uh, so we need to work on this. India's growth cannot be taken for granted. But I also want to emphasize that our slow growth is not all the fault of the pandemic. It is something that has been building up. Our underperformance actually dates from perhaps the global financial crisis and its aftermath. Um, and the key measure of this underperformance, I mean, Indian statistics, we don't collect statistics on the right things. And when the right things give the wrong answer, we suppress those statistics. So in that sense, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's not rely on statistics, just read the papers. Our biggest problem is we're not creating enough good jobs. You can see with the protests against the uh, Agnipat scheme. What is the Agnipat scheme for those who are, uh, who don't follow the Indian scene uh, closely? The government announced a change in military recruitment. Now, uh, you know, at the entry level, three quarters of the people will be recruited for four years. Uh, and, and then given a, an exit uh, handshake, and the rest will stay on. Now, this seems like something, you know, that could make the, uh, the military uh, much younger and, and more effective, perhaps less well-trained. There's a lot of debate on all that. But what is important is a lot of young people took to the streets on hearing this, simply because government jobs are, in a sense, the, the last resort given there are few other jobs available. You've all heard about 12 million applicants in the railways for 35,000 jobs. You see and uh, you know, many students sitting for exam after exam, public service exam, until they superannuate. They become too old to take more exams. And then they have to actually look for a job uh, which is non-government. 
Now, the worrisome thing about all these people looking for government jobs is not just the fact that you know uh, jobs are so scarce, but the fact that they're so scarce despite the fact that our biggest minority, women, are not really entering the labor force in a big way. Uh, India's female labor force participation is among the lowest in the G20 at 20.3% in 2019. We rivaled Saudi Arabia for how bad it was for women. In fact, now Saudi Arabia has become much better because they focused on increasing labor force participation. They've got it up to 33%. We've actually gone down over the pandemic uh, in terms of female labor force participation. So think about how much richer India would be as a country if its frustrated youth, its women, uh, could get good jobs. And therefore, you know, despite all the rara, strongest growing uh, large economy in the world, et cetera, et cetera, the fact is the economy is not working for many of our youth. That itself is a reason to ask, what's gone wrong? And our record, I, I don't want to start by saying there's only wrong. In fact, India's record is very good if you look at the two decades after the 1991 reforms. We grew at an average of about 7% a year, which is, you know, with very few exceptions, one of the strongest records uh, in development. I mean, China is, is much better. We get, keep getting compared with China, but China is unique in some sense in a large country being able to force its way out of poverty. And India is not that far behind, uh, you know, um, uh, it's certainly in percentage terms. And we've had notable successes even in the last decade of relatively slow growth. Well, let me give you one example. The Aadhaar stack, which was conceived by Nandan Nilekani, uh, you know, has created a tremendous number of possible applications, including one that we were involved with at the Reserve Bank of India, the Universal Payment Interface. Uh, that started in 2016. Uh, you know, the nice thing when you're in charge of the bank is you can take credit for everything. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to take credit for uh, whatever role we played there. Of course, the National Payment uh, uh, Corporation of India played a much bigger role. But we have 4 billion transactions a month now on UPI. What is UPI? Uh, some of you have used it, basically the ability to pay for anything uh, you know, by just scanning the QR code of the shopkeeper and making a direct transfer from your bank account. I think there's an echo coming. Uh, making a direct transfer from your bank account to that shopkeeper's account. That facilitates payments, but also facilitates inclusion because now you don't have to go to an ATM to take out money. Uh, and if you are sitting on top of a hill in, uh, you know, in one of our hilly areas, you don't have to go to the valley to go take out money from the ATM. You can use your mobile phone to make payments uh, up there. Now, we started UPI in uh, 2016. Uh, the Fed is only now, in 2023 actually, not even now, go to start Fed now, which is the equivalent to the UPI. So in some sense, uh, even in, in high tech payments, uh, uh, you know, India has been ahead in some, some areas. There are other examples of Indian successes, such as our many unicorns, our discount price mission to Mars, 72 million, uh, 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 according to one telling, uh, of sending a satellite from the from India uh, from India to, to Mars. Uh, of course, our Thomas Cup team uh, recently won uh, the Thomas Cup, uh, and uh, despite our loss yesterday, I think our cricket team is still pretty good. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, we have successes, but if we dwell only on them and don't assess our failings critically, we increase the chance of underperformance. And so let me ask the question, if India and Indians have so much potential, not more than any other peoples in the world, but we are 1.4 billion people. So um, why is it that India is faltering? Uh, why aren't we doing better? Why are we failing our youth? And I will argue it's not the fault of our people as much as it is a failure of imagination 
of our politics and leadership. And I would say that failure is more recent than in the more distant past when we grew very strongly. What worked in those early decades was really a willingness to trust the people, to create a framework where we liberalized and allowed uh, you know, people to utilize their creativity and enterprise by creating the kinds of frameworks or infrastructure that freed them. One example was Prime Minister Vajpayee's Golden Quadrilateral pro Project, right? Basically building roads connecting uh, the whole of India, highways, and then uh, rural roads to connect villages to, to the highways. And that opened up a whole set of markets which created enormous development. You have to think about a village which is connected to a, a pakka road, a, a paved road, and how that changes the environment in that village, because now it can access the city. When it can access the city, you can start you know, poultry farming, you can start sending vegetables to the city, incomes start growing within the village. As incomes grow, you can start buying more. So shops start opening up, services expand. Okay, now people can afford to buy scooters rather than go on cycles. So repair shops open up for scooters. Development happens in front of your eyes. So that's one example of creating infrastructure. And of course, uh, the government today is still creating those rural roads, but it started with uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee and his golden quadrilateral project. But it was not just hard infrastructure. We also realized the, the need to augment that by improving schooling and, and the schooling and skilling of our workforce. As the period of reforms unfurled in the uh, 1990s and the 2000s, we also saw a substantial increase in the years of schooling in the Indian population. We finally focused on enhancing the human capital of our people. And the steady liberalization of tariffs and regulations made our economy more competitive, gave our firms more uh, reason to, to, to expand. Um, and finally, we also strengthened the power of the citizen of the government through acts like the Right to Information Act, which allowed the citizen to question the government and ask, why are you doing thus and such thing? Of course, government reacts by saying, no, no, we can't reveal this, we can't reveal that. But for the first time, the citizen had the right to question the government. Uh, all this led to 7% growth. But of course, the question is, where did that growth go? Uh, why are we now down to 4 and 5% even in good times on average? And uh, you know what's going on? We simply aren't, as I said, creating the jobs our, our youth need. Now, of course, we have to ask then, what is the government's vision? The current government's vision seems to center around the term Atman Nirbhar, or self-reliance. We're going to be dependent on ourselves. Sounds good. Uh, and it, in some ways, it is a continuation of the past I was talking about. We're going to create, for example, in the last budget, more emphasis on connecting India, on logistics, and devote more resources to it. That's good. That's part of the framework. That's part of enabling people and that will help. But in some ways, Atman Nirbhar takes us back to a more distant and failed past, be before the period of reforms, when we focused primarily on physical capital and producing goods, not human capital and services. And we tried to do it through protection and subsidies, not through liberalization and competition. So for a, in, uh, a project that works on trade, uh, we're trying to go back to the environment where trade was not such a big uh, factor. In fact, um, we were doing import substitution at that time. Now, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can explore, which I'll do in a second, what the elements of the strategy are. But one thing that certainly is, is, is worrisome is the neglect of human capital. Think, for example, of how many children have been out of school for the last two or three years. Uh, I mean, there's some kind of school that many of our poorest kids have been at, in the sense that maybe schools have been transmitting on a small uh, mobile, but you know connections are weak, uh, are haphazard, <coughs> most kids don't have access to a smartphone. How much have these kids really learned? 
And if you've been out of school for two years, it doesn't mean that you're two years behind because you've also forgotten two years worth of school. So you're actually three or four years behind, and that's what the studies are showing. These kids are way behind. Wouldn't you think the single biggest mantra for a government should be, how do we get kids back to school? How do we get, not lose a generation of kids? Because remember, it's 12 years worth of kids who have all experienced no schooling. How do we get kids back to perform? Uh, otherwise, this is going to be a huge source of inequality, stress, and underperformance in the years going forward. How much do you hear this being talked about in Indian uh, circles? Not much. We're spending a ton on what I'll call the PLI schemes. I'll explain that in a second. But we're not devoting more money to these kids who are lost. Now, maybe the central government thinks it's the role of the state governments to take care of children. And certainly the government I've been involved with, the Tamil Nadu government, has a scheme, uh, the Ilam Thedi Kalvi, which is an attempt to hire uh, local workers, uh, over 175,000 of them, to offer remedial learning to children who uh, were in school to get them to like learning again, to get them back up to speed so that they can, their classes, they're not so far out of sync in their classes. Tamil Nadu has a pretty good education system. They found five lakh kids, that is half a million kids, had dropped out. And now these are being coaxed back. Now, Tamil Nadu has a good system, I said. Think about the states that don't have good systems. Think about how many kids have dropped out. And why, you know, why don't you see more concern about this? Why don't you see more uh, money devoted to this? And I would argue that it's partly the responsibility of the states, but it's also partly the responsibility of the center. We are focusing too much on the wrong things. It is not physical capital. It's not the PLI scheme which is most important as getting these kids back to school, getting them educated once again. So I keep saying PLI. What is PLI? The government is devoting a lot of resources to what are called production-linked incentives. This is a way to try and get manufacturing going in India. Now, why is the government so interested in manufacturing? Well. I would argue that part of the reason is, even though India has grown strongly, India sees China as an example of a country that has done even better. So we want to be like them. In 1995, China and India were about neck to neck in per capita uh, uh, GDP, about 1830 and 1560 in per capita terms. Well, that's the same, same uh, almost in the order of magnitude. The numbers today are 17,200 uh, in PPP terms per capita income for China and about 6,000 for India. So even in PPP terms, China's three times. At market exchange rates, the per capita income of China is five times India. And since we have about the same population, China is five times bigger as an economy. This is one of the reasons people look at China and say, they did something right. Why can't we replicate that? Now, of course, China came to this path in a very different way. Chinese growth initially was achieved by suppressing wages and consumption, focusing on exports, and enabling industries by providing them cheap capital by also underpaying households for their, in their savings. The, uh, you know, deposit rates were kept really low. Cheap capital flowed through the banking system to corporations. And wages were kept low so that these corporations made a significant amount of money. That enabled them to grow as they grew, wages increased. Uh, the question is, can India do this? China could keep wages low because in some ways it, it is in, in many ways it's an authoritarian government. And it could also suppress deposit rates because there was no competition. It was the state-owned banking system which doubled in much and they were told what they could pay. Now over time this model has proved successful because China has then created a more educated workforce, decent infrastructure and eventually also reduced tariffs. Now we have a very different starting point. Uh, we're a democracy. It's, we've got unions. 
uh, it's going to be, and we've got a population that complains. Uh, so it's going to be very hard to uh, suppress wages. It's going to be very hard to tell depositors we're going to underpay you uh, because it's important for industry. And so given these constraints, if you want to go on a manufacturing-led growth path, what do you do? Well, the government basically has been trying to do this partly by improving logistics. That's what I, uh, I said earlier, and that's a good thing. But also through higher tariffs and production subsidies for manufacturers. And let me explain how this works by looking at cell phones. In 2017, tariffs on cell phones imported into India were raised from 10% to 20%. Okay, so every time you import a cell phone, you've got to pay 20% on, on that cell phone. And in 2020, producers of cell phones in India were offered 6% of the product's invoice price. In other words, you manufacture in India, you get a 6% subsidy. Okay, so uh, the reason for the subsidy is the old one. Look, uh, India suffers from a bunch of disabilities. Uh, for example, we don't have adequate infrastructure, we don't have adequate power, limited design capabilities, industry doesn't focus on R&D, worker skills are not up to the mark. There are all these problems. That's why we're not manufacturing. We're going to offer you a subsidy in order for you to manufacture in India, and we're going to take it away eventually. So we're going to protect you through tariff protection. We're going to help you through subsidies. We're going to take it away eventually. But for now, this is a benefit. Come produce in India. Now, what is important to remember is that this uh, kind of subsidy that's offered is offered on the invoice price. Okay, Remember, even if you produce in India, you're importing a whole bunch of stuff. You're not actually uh, you know, doing all your value added in India. So that subsidy of 6% of the invoice price is a huge percentage of the value added you're producing. So if you, uh, the typical value added in a cell phone, even in, in um, countries that are advanced, is 25%. 25% of the invoice price, I get 6% subsidy. That means uh, almost 20 or 30% of the cell phone that I produce is pure profit to me. Who would not manufacture in India under these circumstances? So we're seeing growth in companies coming and setting up a factory in India and manufacturing. Now the question is, what, is, what does manufacture mean? Are they just putting together parts and selling it in India because of the huge subsidy? Or are they really building out their supply chains? I hope it's the latter, but there's nothing that prevents it from being the former, that you can get production subsidies just for producing this stuff in India. Now, in addition, they have the tariff protection. So this makes it very nice to produce in India, but of course, for those jobs that are being created, we're paying a lot. We're paying a lot because just, I mean, an example, the, the iPhone 13 is not produced in India, but it's sold in India. The iPhone 13 Pro Max is available for 90,366 rupees in Chicago. That's the dollar equivalent. In India, it's available for 129,000 rupees. That's a markup of 43%. Who's going to pay for that? Anybody who buys an iPhone in India is paying that markup. And this is, I guess the same point is to be made with respect to cell phones that are being sold in India, that the Indian consumer is paying for it, the Indian taxpayers paying for it through these subsidies. And so the, the whole question is, where is this going? The government says once they produce in India, they will build out the whole value chain in India. That's a hope. That's not a reality. Now, what happened in the license permit Raj is because of the subsidies, because of the tariffs, they basically became a high cost producer. They were protected. They never improved the quality or efficiency of their production. I mean, remember, for those of you who are old, who are old enough, none of, most of you are not, we used to have the Ambassador Cup. It was the Morris Oxford of 1953. Unchanged in everything except the headlights. <laughs> until 1991 when it stopped production. Right? What killed it? Basically, uh, we started producing other stuff and we opened up to competition. Now, what is to prevent cell phone production from going that way? 
the government says we're going to stop subsidies, so they can't really maintain their own production. But could these guys basically say, oh, you know, we need subsidies for another year, we're still not competitive. You haven't changed anything on the ground. You haven't improved the quality of R&D. The power situation is still so bad. Infrastructure is terrible. You said you were going to spend time improving this, but if you haven't improved it, we still want the subsidies. Well, you may say, well, the government can always remove the subsidies. What are these guys going to say? Well, we employ 3,000 people in a politically sensitive constituency in Karnataka. Are you going to remove the subsidies and force us to fire all these people because we're going to say, the government removed the subsidies, what can we do? In other words, you've set up a negotiation process. I think the jury is still out. We want to see if A, government improves the manufacturing environment, B, the government removes the subsidies, C, manufacturers build more in India without the subsidies and become world class. There are many steps in this process, and the worry is we won't even take step one. They would produce while the subsidies are available, while the tariffs are available, and then uh, keep lobbying to try and uh, continue them. Uh, the point, I, I, what I'm saying, what I worry about, is that not just cell phone manufacturing. We're getting PLI being announced in budgets for this industry, that industry, and, and, and yet another industry. Today, we have a PLI scheme worth $10 billion, 10 billion in subsidies from the government for chip manufacturing in India. I mean, the, the real question is, couldn't that 10 billion be used far more effectively, not to build chip factories by subsidizing big industrialists, but by building maybe 200 colleges of world class, which would train 20,000 engineers, who could then do chip design, which would then create far more value in India than going the chip manufacturing route. Okay? So that, I mean, the question is, what do we spend on? Um, the way is that with the PLI strategy, we're putting a lot of eggs into one basket, the manufacturing basket. And if you look at manufacturing, resistance to export-led growth in manufacturing is building across the world. We're seeing a lot of talk about insuring, reshoring in the industrial world. Why is it that they're doing that? One is for strategic reasons. But the other is many countries are resistant to importing large amounts of goods because of the fact that they've seen it's de-industrialized them. And so, you know, the tariffs on Chinese imports into the US, uh, but you can expect if India was successful in creating an export-led growth strategy in manufacturing, we'd see some of those political problems. In other words, just as China is becoming much more aware of the problems with export-led manufacturing, we're jumping in, uh, you know, feet first into this. And is that a good strategy, even if it works, and of course, I've said there are many questions about whether it will work. So what's the alternative? And that's what I want to end with. I mean, there is a alternative path building on India's vision of increasing openness and liberalization. And this is focusing on their minds, on Indian uh, minds and capabilities and creativity, but also on its liberal democracy. And, and here, I'm talking about catering to demand in the much larger global market but not goods demand. I'm talking about catering to service demand, uh, which already India exports fair amount. Uh, people don't know how much India exports in services, but it's where we have a net surplus, which uh, helps us run large deficits in goods manufacturing. Now, I'm not saying we need to choose either or in, in stock terms. We don't need to abandon manufacturing. We've got a lot of strong manufacturers. But I'm saying, let's not move to putting enormous amounts of resources in fostering manufacturing as in the PLI scheme. Now, uh, it's approaching 50,000 crores a year and uh, could increase significantly. Let's think about increasing the other side. What will it take to increase service exports from India? 
What do we need to do there? And if we need to choose between putting a dollar of government money here or a dollar of government money there, let's think about where it is more appropriate to put that money. So um, now, I think the environment for service exports has changed substantially uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has made it easy to offer high value added services at a distance. Many of you have experienced that, right? You, many of you students have taken classes at a distance. I, I admit, I've taught these classes at a distance. It's not 100% as effective as teaching in the classroom, but it gets you 80 to 90% of the way. And if you pay significantly less, I shouldn't uh, <laughs> say this in front of academic administrators, but, uh, but if you pay significantly less, uh, then it's, it makes it really worthwhile. Similarly, consulting. My niece worked uh, throughout the pandemic in Bangalore, catering to uh, companies in Hyderabad, uh, Bombay, etc., without actually traveling there. Why can't she cater from her global firm to clients in Austin, Texas, or Chicago, Illinois, and uh, do the same uh, you know, at a distance? Uh, for the market for services like consulting, legal, financial advisory, education, and telemedicine. There was, telemedicine uh, ramped up to about 20% of medicine during the pandemic. Why can't we learn from that and figure out how to deliver services at a distance across the world? Um, now, undoubtedly, you immediately come up against protectionism in services, and it takes various forms. I'll come to some of that in a second. However, the advantage in services is the strongest economies in the world, like the United States, the Euro area, are big producers of services, and therefore they also have an interest in open services trade. And so if we go to services, uh, there certainly is a chance if we, if we push that that we can get uh, more liberalization in services. Now, in services, India has a key asset. It's liberal democracy. And why do I say democracy is an asset to service exports? Well, remember that a element in providing services is shared values and trust, especially around the data that are harvested. Now, when uh, a vacuum cleaner is sold, don't really care about who produced that vacuum cleaner, only that it works. But if you are consulting with a physician um, at a distance, you really care about what they do with the information you give them. Can it be used to blackmail you? Well, you have had some nervous episodes. Will that be used to extract stuff from you? Will that country's government start using that to get you to do things for them in the in the businesses that in the business that you work in. In other words, once you get to the kinds of services I'm talking about, data become much more sensitive, and therefore it is very important that you give them assurance. This is what I'm going to do with the data. This is how I'm going to protect the data from my government. This is how it will not be used to blackmail or to snoop. And that's where transparency, democracy, rule of law, all those things we talk about start coming in because that's what will build trust, the sense that you will do something that is reasonable. A third advantage is, of course, Indians are uh, fortunately or unfortunately known for services the world over, I should say fortunately. Uh, everyone has a good doctor of Indian origin, whether working for the health services or elsewhere. And many CEOs have good consultants of Indian origin. The Indian diaspora has created a brand image for India. Uh, if I walk into a, if I go in a taxi, everybody asks me, are you a, are you a doctor? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I say, yes, I am, but the wrong one. Uh, <laughs> similarly, with our software engineers, we have a brand image. And uh, if India has stronger, uh, maintains its democratic credentials and in fact strengthens them, uh, it'll have a strong comparative advantage in selling to the democracies of the world, much more so than a Russia or a China. And a final reason for a focus on services, if we are going to put our eggs in some strategic basket, is that the world has to grow green. It is, it is 
unfortunately, are, you know, the only uh, way forward. And, you know, consumption of goods cannot grow at the pace at which it has grown in the past, even if poor countries become richer. More of the consumption basket will increasingly consist of services, including creative services, even for moderate income countries. So if we were to pick sectors of the future, are we going to pick manufacturing, which is increasingly harder and more backward looking, or are we going to pick services, which is increasingly the future? My guess is services would make sense. Okay, I want to leave time for questions, but let me just uh, make two points. One, which you would immediately ask is, yeah, this is all sort of uh, nice for the high, uh, you know, highly educated upper middle class youth of India. Um, they can maybe get a foreign degree and offer consulting services in the US or elsewhere. What about the rest? How are we going to create jobs for the rest? And uh, the second question is, OK, you have this, this, this suggestion that we can do well here. What else do we need to do in order to, uh, to, to go in a big way to services? So um, first, the important question, will this create the jobs? Now, remember, I'm not saying do away with manufacturing. I'm saying when you emphasize stuff, uh, think about emphasizing the mind, creativity, services. The mind and creativity is also important for manufacturing. Many of our successes in manufacturing have come not so much in the low-skilled manufacturing assembly area, but in the high-skilled pharmaceuticals software area. So this is not inconsistent with where we've been successful in, in manufacturing. But at the same time, there are lots of services which are uh, employment intensive. Think of construction, think of tourism. These are employment intensive services. But what I'm especially emphasizing is new thrust areas, such as um, you know, high, high value added services. Think of education. In many services like education, only the lack of a strong degree prevents our faculty from teaching around the world. Um, and it also prevents our students from getting those acclaimed jobs as consultants or, or uh, doctors around the world. So quality higher education in India is a must. It's no longer a luxury. For a long time, we were over investing in higher education. Now it's a necessity if we want to migrate our, our students to being able to service the world. But we can also provide that service to the youth of the world. Uh, Students in the Middle East used to come a lot to India, in Africa. And we can expand those services uh, uh, in, in those countries. But we can also, in, through distance uh, teaching, service the rest of the world. Uh, you know, uh, EdTech is actually making inroads in teaching uh, students in other countries. Now, these are, of course, quality jobs, uh, that of a teacher, that of a tutor for, for Baiju or, or some of the other ed tech companies. But each of these high skilled jobs, if performed from India, creates four or five other jobs for the less skilled. Every school, university, or ed tech platform creates jobs for teachers and tutors, no doubt, but it also creates jobs for clerical staff, coaches, cooks, cleaners, ground staff, and security guards. Now, these are not great jobs, but they are jobs. And what we need is jobs. Jobs that can migrate up, but at least jobs to start with. Our ambition shouldn't stop at creating these jobs. We should be ambitious in migrating these jobs upwards, but if we, at least we'll start. And these are just the possibilities in education. Think of the possibilities in medicine, fintech, consultancy, legal services, and of course, tourism. Uh, the note you provided me said 6% of GDP is tourism in India. In other countries, it's much higher, 12%, almost double. There's a huge amount we can do in tourism. But who wants to go tour an authoritarian country where there are riots every day, etc.? That's not where we want, that's not, that's not the image we want to project. We want to project the image of a loving, welcoming country which is open to the world where we treat our people decently and we treat visitors. With, uh, with great affection. So India has a lot it can do in services. 
but relying on its, uh, its, its past of, of uh, demo democratic liberal openness. And if we do that, we can be the first country that transitions directly from um, uh, agriculture to services without going through manufacturing. So in that case, the premature deindustrialization that Professor Danny Roderick worries about is not a bug for India. It's a feature of the Indian process. Now, last point. We're not going to get there without work. India has deficiencies. Let's be realistic about it. Uh, we have a lot of students in universities. We have a lot of students in schools. But as, as, as we just talked about earlier, our schooling has big problems, even without the pandemic, but with, with the pandemic, additional problems. And our higher education is not up to the mark in, in, in many cases. We need to upgrade in a significant way. So that's, that's job one, increase capabilities. Second, um, we need a government, because we're going through a more difficult, different path, we need a government that is more pragmatic, transparent, decentralized, and open to challenge. In other words, we need a learning government, a government that sees what's happening, hears it, and adjusts accordingly. Not a government that says, I know, here it is, take it or leave it. And, and third, we need a world order that is more hospitable to trade and services. So it's not going to happen automatically. There are huge vested interests in services. So India has to you know, start being part of the process of opening up. I am arguing that because there's a lot more services being uh, performed by industrial countries. It may be a lot easier than perhaps resisting the protectionism that is building up in, in manufacturing. Um, so let me just uh, elaborate e on each of these points a little bit and then close. Uh, putting people first. Uh, if we are to create the service-led growth, we need people to have the right capabilities and that means building those capabilities uh, in our people. First point is to give everybody a fair chance. If you want talent, you have to draw from everywhere, including our largest minority women, but also uh, religious minorities like Muslims and uh, uh, our disadvantaged castes and tribes. So we have to have a, a tr society that treats everybody equal. Um, I say this not just because of the economic benefits. A discriminatory society is not just immoral. It is also weak. It is weak because it is internally divided. No minority treated as second class citizens would stay docile in the face of the oppressive behavior of the majority. That is a fact of history. We just need to look to our neighbor to the south, Sri Lanka, and see what happens when you mistreat large minority. And so we should know that division offers a handle for outsiders to intervene. We don't want to be divided. This is a time for uniting, and uniting on the basis of equality is the only way to go. Second, people, even the very poor, know what is best for them. So uh, trying to empower people to seek better futures for them, for their children, is part of this process of change. Just, just don't think it's going to be top down. Allow it to be bottom up. And allowing it to be bottom up means, for example, putting cash in their hands, direct transfers, so that they can buy what they want. And what often it will be is not drink, as some people argue. These guys are going to uh, blow it away. Instead, it's going to be better education for their kids. And they're going to be part of that process. And once they're paying for it, they also have more ability to influence the quality because they actually have the money and they're not uh, getting a freebie uh, from top down. This also means that government has to be more responsive. And one way to make government more responsive is to decentralize functions, funds, and functionaries, not just from the center to the state, but from the state to the local government to the panchayat. This allows each panchayat to find out what works best for its problems and for it to adopt policies that are more suitable to the locality. It allows the local people to identify that that person is responsible, not somebody distant in the state capital or the national capital. That person is responsible for the quality of my school. I'm going to go talk to them to fix the problem that the teacher never shows up. They paying the teacher. 
Therefore, they have the ability to make a difference, and I'm going to see that they're responsible. So decentralization of government is part of the answer to get people to enhance capabilities. And lastly, we need much more weight on individual rights and freedoms so that people can be critical. A lot of the you know, uh, acts like the UAPA or the sedition law is used, are you, they're used to stamp down on criticism. Somebody who criticizes is an axolite. They are uh, unhappy uh, and against the state and we're going to put them away. Uh, that suppresses criticism often used by lazy government officials uh, to, uh, to essentially protect their turf. Um, we need to remove these acts and work far better in uh, not using the crutch of these draconian acts in order to uh, provide a good security environment. We can do better than what colonial governments did in the past. <coughs> Second point, learning government. So first, increase people's capabilities by empowering them, getting them to, uh, to, to do more. Second, learning government. Um, in this kind of environment, government has to experiment. First at a small scale, then roll out more widely, rather than imposing it from on top at a wide scale without any evidence that anything that they impose will work. So in other words, I would have started the PLI scheme small, see that it works, then roll it out. Instead of before I know it's success, roll it out everywhere. Similarly, Agnipat, I would have done it small and then uh, rolled it out more widely once I know it actually works. That kind of experimentation uh, also needs criticism. If I don't have criticism, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. If I actively suppress criticism, every uh, press report that is critical, I call the editor up and say, why did you publish it? In that case, I'm never going to learn because I'm only going to learn when people come out on the streets to protest. That's going to be my learning. That's not a particularly good way to learn. In fact, I suppress the most important way of learning, which is learning from statistics. I don't know what the death rate from COVID was in India. The studies say it could be anywhere between four to six million. The government says it was 500,000. There's a huge gap between these numbers. And of course, because the studies are done by independent sources, we tend to believe them more. Can't we improve the quality of our statistics? Today, unemployment statistics in India, nobody knows what they are, simply because the government doesn't collect them effectively. Now, you wonder if it doesn't collect them because it doesn't know how to. That can't be a, an answer or because the answer would be particularly troubling. So these are places where we can do better because policy depends on knowing what the right numbers are. If we don't know the right numbers, we make bad policy. So protecting speech, protecting criticism, improving data collection, this is all part of good government. Last point, if we are to do all this, we need to lead global change. The world is not going to do what we want. We need to be far more proactive in global change. For example, telemedicine requires Indian medical degrees to be recognized elsewhere. Or at least Indian doctors to be allowed to take exams elsewhere that qualify them to provide telemedicine. It would be even easier if the National Health Service, for example, in the UK, paid for treatment provided from India. Then we could reduce the queues in the National Health Service, win for the UK, increase employment in India, win for India. Right? So why can't we get this win-win situation? Well, we need to negotiate our way. Instead of constantly harping on trying to protect agriculture or industry in global negotiations, let's talk about how we can create some more of these win-win situations. Let us use our G20 presidency, which is coming next year, yeah. to improve the environment for service exports, including for many of our... In other words, let's not have a 20th century view of how we negotiate. It's not about negotiating farmer protections. Agriculture is 15% of GDP. We have to treat our farmers better. But it's not through these, these uh, you know, tariffs, uh, etc. What we need to do is negotiate a way for them out of agriculture mm -hmm. by creating more job opportunities mm -hmm. outside. That means things like services. Finally, we, we do need to improve our laws. For example, our laws protecting privacy, uh, data uh, uh, collection, uh, including protect them from our own government, which can be somewhat intrusive in what it looks at. Our government being bound by laws that everybody sees 
and everybody can understand, would be a way for us to steal a march over more authoritarian countries in providing services to the world. So we need checks and balances in that process. We need a good uh, uh, law on information which limits the role of government in, in intruding on, on private interests there. So uh, to conclude, we need an Indian path. I mean, the Chinese path will not work for us. We need an Indian path that draws on the capabilities of all Indians and builds on India's historic culture of tolerance and respect. It builds on India's liberalism, not just the fact we have regular elections. That's not the entirety of liberalism. It's the fact that we can argue and debate and criticize. We can have ideas that are diametrically opposite to that of the government. That will actually improve the quality of Indian governance because criticism makes us better. It will also make India more trusted by citizens elsewhere. So we can become a Vishwa Guru. The word Vishwa Guru is much used by the current government, but not based on the ideas of the past only, but really on a model of development for the future, which is green, which is inclusive, which is local-led, and which persuades the world by showing that it actually works. We need to make it work. It's not going to be easy given current trends, but we can all work to make it happen. Let me stop there. Thank you. for that very interesting conversation. Um, you talked about a lot of interesting things, of course. You talked about... You can, can you hear? You can't hear. Let's see. Is, I think we've got to get closer uh, to the mic. I don't think it's... it's Actually, I don't think it's working. Is that yes. I'll, I'll have a look at it. Yeah, now have it. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Closer. All right. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. So you talked about a lot of interesting things. I'm glad you touched upon some of the successes. You talked about digital payments. I do think that's transformed the lives of many Indians and it's made their jobs easier, their daily life easier, their business uh, businesses uh, easier. You talked about the startup ecosystem to some extent, the un unicorns uh, in India that we are seeing. There is certainly some innovation that's happening, which is uh, very, very inspiring and very heartening to see. You talked about the Indian cricket team. Unfortunately, they lost yesterday, but we have a season full of cricket ahead of us in the next couple of months, and we'll be rooting for them. So that's exciting. And you talked, of course, also about the path ahead, a number of things that we need to do. I want to go a little bit back when you started uh, to talking about some of the problems. Uh, one of the things that really stayed with me was you saying, imagine how rich India could be if our youth and women joined the workforce. And Really, unemployment is something that needs a lot of thought and a lot of reflection. So according to CMIE data, like you said, we do have a data issue right now in the country, but we have data from CMIE which found that between 2017 and 2022, the overall labor participation rate dropped from 46% to 40%. That is only 40% of Indians of legal working age were employed or were looking for jobs in 21-22. And among women, of course, this data is even starker, having fallen from about 15% in 2017 to 9.2% now. You said we are competing with Saudi Arabia, and perhaps they're actually doing better than us now. And this is, of course, very problematic. And I have two questions attached to this. One is a question related to representation. And of course, we need, uh, you know, and that's part of liberal democratic values, to make sure that a minority of any kind, even if not just a minority in numbers, but a minority in terms of resources and opportunities. We take everybody along. We take all our disenfranchised communities along. This includes the Dalit Bahujan Adivasi communities. We have data which shows that they are less likely to be employed in the formal sectors. They are le less likely to get promotions. They are worse paid and one of the first to become unemployed when a crisis hit. It includes women. We just talked about them. It includes religious uh, minorities, sexual minor minorities, and so on. So one is the issue of representation. How do we make sure? that our workforce becomes more representative? How do we actually change that? And then the other, of course, you talked about unemployment and you talked about some of the growth paths to it. You talked about schooling, you know, human uh, building capability. Uh, so that is cer certainly very important. One of the things that I want to reflect a little bit upon is related to large firms, is related to manufacturing. 
And uh, according to a McKinsey report, large companies with revenues exceeding $500 million, uh, and there are only 600 of these in India, they are 2.3 times more productive than mid-sized firms. They account for almost 40% of total exports, and they employ 20% of the direct formal workforce. But we have far fewer of these compared to many, uh, many of the other developing countries. So one of the problems that we do face in terms of employment, because large firms employ more people, is the inability of small firms to transition to medium-sized firms and medium-sized firms to transition to large firms. So any reflections on that? How do we help our firms to become bigger? Um, so these two. Okay. Um, uh, let me start with the second. The first is on inclusion. How do we make the workforce more inclusive? The second is you know, small to large. First, you know, even on large firms, uh, focus on how capital intensive they are. So it's not that they're providing a whole, whole lot of labor services. And this is also the point about what I didn't speak about when we say manufacturing-led growth. It's not going to be a lot of workers, it's not going to be a lot of workers putting together stuff in a very big way. Uh, typically, where we have been such successful is high-skilled manufacturing which employs relatively few workers, a lot more capital. And so if we are focused on the export strategy for manufacturing, that's going to be the pattern rather than no skilled workers. Uh, that said, uh, you know, one of the problems clearly is the business environment. We need a business environment which is far more tolerant of new businesses starting as well as new businesses growing. Instead, the historical sort of past is you you know, hit the business as soon as it grows beyond a certain size with a huge ton of regulations. You shall have a pension, you'll have this, you'll have that, you have to have meet 35 different authorities. And of course, when we say we ease the path for many of these, typically the way we ease the path is have one website where you can apply to the 35 different government offices, but not simplify the number of forms you need to do. I mean, states are working on this. and and. They are trying to do more, and hopefully we'll have more success. But I'll tell you my experience of, you know, there was this um, um, guest house in, uh, in um, guest house owner in, in the Nilgiris in, in Tamil Nadu. And he had uh, sort of uh, bought into an existing guest house instead of opening a new one. And uh, why did he open, uh, go into the existing guest house, which was very limiting in many ways to his plans? And he said, this is the one thing if I wanted to open a new guest house, I have no idea who to apply to because I'm, it's just a complete uh, non-starter. We started a university in, in, in South India. Uh, you would think that governments would be really, really happy somebody wants to put money of their own to start a university. They're not. In fact, we did exactly the same thing. We took over the license from an existing university in order to be able to run that new university. This, that's just the business environment for all that we talk about. It's easier, it's, uh, we've gone up the doing business scale. It's still very difficult. The more new f firms come in, the more small firms come in, uh, but you've create, opened the way for them to come in, you've also opened the way for them to grow. So we need to work on our institutional structures, you need to work on credit, you need to work on in the inspectorage, you need to work on a whole bunch of things. We need to do far more. But, but certainly the point you make is, is absolutely right. We need uh, small firms to grow into large firms. That's where the job creation happens, and we need to foster that. We can't have a lot of small firms which stay small. Um, on the uh, inclusion, I mean, this is, this is tough, right? The easiest way to include is, say, thou shalt hire. <laughs> and thou shalt hire X percent who are women, Y percent who are Dalits, uh, Z percent who are this or that. And the problem then is you're creating a vulnerability for the firm if the people that are hired are not up to the mark. So the best way to do it is to increase capabilities, to focus on the training, the teaching, uh, the capability building so that they can legitimately get that job and not be questioned and, and do well. But of course, you run into a different problem, which is in many situations, uh, these um, you know, disadvantaged minorities don't have the networks, which would allow them to essentially get those capabilities and, and strengthen them, right? So uh, for example, you know, many middle class parents have to help the kids uh, do homework. 
uh, these kids growing up in underprivileged uh, uh, families don't have that help. So how do, you, how do you substitute for the network? And also, there's a job network. I know so, my, my father knows so and so, therefore I get an in, interview in that business and I get into that, that business. These guys don't have that network. So we do have to think about whether we should make some compromises on quality in order to start building networks and eventually remove those compromises as, as uh, you know, uh, people get better. But those are the kinds of debates that we are having, we need to have more of uh, in order to increase the level of inclusion. Last point, we can do policy much more clever, uh, cleverly, right? So, so the Tamil Nadu government, as an example, used to give uh, women who got married a gold bangle. Uh, but that created a kind of uh, sort of imagery that what you want to do was women to get married and settle down at home. Now what they do is they, uh, for any uh, girl who goes to school, uh, to college, they pay a thousand rupees a month as, as, as fees. Uh, that, to my mind, is a way of getting policy in the right direction. You're helping them build capabilities rather than telling them your place is in the home, get married and settle down. So we can do far more. That, that's a great example. I mean, I, I imagine some of this is related to what the electorate rewards you for, what kind of messaging the electorate rewards you for, but I think that is um, a great example. Uh, I want to move a little bit now to one of the things you said towards the end, which was related to decentralization in governance, and you talked about looking through the different levels of the government. The, of course, there's the center, but there's the state, and then all the way down to Panchayati Raj. Now, one of the things that, um, that I've been thinking about is that Indian cities account for 63% of the country's GDP, but all the major growth centers are in the west or south. And you talked, talked a bit about that as well. The Hindi-speaking states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and Madhya Pradesh, or the Hindi heartland, in particular, has no economic growth centers despite having almost half a billion um, of, of our country's population, or half a billion population. And the average per capita income, again, you know, of, of the five southern states is three times that of, that of UPs, five times uh, that of Bihars. And these states also rank poorly on most human development indices. Now, to my mind, these are obvious danger. There, there are obvious dangers to such lopsided um, development where such a large part of our country remains outside the benefits of economic growth. What are the reasons for this uneven development? How do we correct for this? And what is the role of the state government? Uh, I mean, this is, this is a real question. Uh, uh, why will, have we seen more convergence? Mm. And um, I, I mean, all the usual answers sort of apply here. Uh, I mean, if you look at Abhijit Banerjee uh, um, and Lakshmi Ayer's work, it has to do with the pattern of agriculture. Mm that the areas that had more egalitarian land holdings uh, as opposed to zamin the zamindari system where uh, you had to pay tax via the zamindar to the government, uh, the rayatwari system, uh, there there was much more of an emphasis on education and human capital. And uh, you know, there are arguments like this, this lies in our history. But of course the question is why doesn't history change? Why are the, uh, uh, you know, why is the Hindi heartbelt still feudal uh, in, in that sense of uh, not focusing? And it's changing. It is changing, uh, especially as the, um, um, for want of a better term, lower caste parties, mm -hmm. uh, the Dalits, the Yadavs, uh, they, they come into power. They are seeing the benefit of education and are focusing more on, on, on demanding more of that. But it's a process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think it will play out as e the economy throws out better jobs. But if even after a college education, you don't get a good job, you're stuck, then it doesn't create that much incentive to push this, this process. So we need to do more uh, on that front. There's a lot of also benefiting from the governance of the South and the West through migration, right? Mm -hmm. There are lots of migrant labor who show up in the big cities of the South and the West coming from Bihar, from uh, Uttar Pradesh um, uh, and Jharkhand. So um, I think uh, I, I don't have an easy answer to why they're relatively underdeveloped. You can look back in history, but there is change happening. It's good change, and I think we need more of it. And as you said, this is a powder keg. Mm -hmm. Why is it a powder keg? 
because what this means is there are big transfers going on in terms of taxes uh, from the south and the west to the north and the east. On the other hand, the north and the east, because they're poorer, are, are growing more in population and have been growing for a long, long time. So political power, which is one man, one, one woman, one vote, is at odds with economic power, which is we're slowing our population growth, we're increasing our income. And that is setting up a, a tussle. Um, already, uh, some southern states have complained about how much they're, they're taxed through the Finance Commission to pay into the common kitty. And uh, they're asking, what do we get in return? Well, they get migration, they get common security, etc. But this gets worse if the disparities increase. So it's something we need to fix sooner rather than later. Yeah, I agree. So thank you very much for that talk. Um, so just to say, I will be brief, and then we will open up, open up the floor to questions from the audience. Initially, pre-liberalization, the emphasis was on heavy industry. Then we have liberalization, a decade later, also the IT boom. So around the time I'm in college or completing college, indeed, Infosys, TCS are names which are on everybody's lips. Employment uh, for us leaving college or Amex kind of outsourcing operations, all of this is growing. In short, service industry, in particular, service exports. Now, on the other hand, India has been fantastically well poised to benefit from the current conflict. Um, in, in Ukraine because of our oil refining capacity um, and the pendulum through industries such as Reliance or Adani has indeed swung entirely back. Um, of course, they are very important for growth. At the moment, the question was whether Boots, the household chain, uh, the, the high street chain will be bought by Reliance, which just shows you the sheer power and the sheer financial capital which these industries um, wield. So what I would put to you is, Indeed, isn't it because of liberal democracy that that pendulum has swung back so effectively due to the quote-unquote virtuous circle cycle between electoral funding, um, which companies can provide, and in turn how government can allocate contracts or ease various barriers to doing business, which have indeed benefited squarely the old industries of the pre-liberalization era. And Infosys is nowhere on anybody's lips anymore, other than Rishi Sunak, perhaps, vicariously. <laughs> so doesn't, I mean, I'm as much in sync with you on wanting a liberal democracy. However, doesn't this dramatically under, undermine our argument? Well, I, I think you want to take out the word liberal and say democracy. What you're talking okay. about is crony capitalism as an efficient way to run a democracy. But it's certainly not a liberal one. Uh, the, the problem with crony capitalism is it eventually reaches limits of its own, which is the cronies want everything, and the cronies can only be efficient in a number of industries. As they expand, the only reason they have access to these new industries is they have easy credit, which is obviously provided by a crony banking system. And you know, eventually, uh, if the markets, if the banking system aren't providing enough checks and balances, you run to the uh, edge of efficiency. You, you, I mean, how can the same bunch of industrialists, in fact, small group of industrialists, be good at everything? They typically are not. And as you've crowded out new entry, you basically become a Mexico. Mexico's problem in moving from middle income to upper income was simply it was so clogged by vested interests, whether in industry or you know, even in, in the teaching sphere in, 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 in public goods. So my sense is we should, we should learn from those exams, merge the two. And, and that may be the broader answer to your question. If we're thinking forward, if we're thinking about new infrastructure, new cities, how do we make sure that the vision is mapped out and the resources are put to work, even if they don't benefit anybody right now? Thank you. Um, the gentleman in the back over there. Two rows down, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajan. My name is Utkarsh. I'm the founder of a company called Network Capital. Um, I wanted to ask, obviously you don't want to go down the route of uh, crony democracy, but what about crypto democracy? When I was hearing you talk, it seemed to me about decentralization. Many of the aspects that you talked about, it seemed like a network state. 
and India stands on blockchain and crypto has been really confusing. I was wondering what you think of this. <laughs> so I, I, I think these new technologies have a place. Uh, I just am a little wary of putting too much weight on them before we've actually, uh, you know, tested them. There, there's some, sometimes um, a mythology built around them. Somehow we use blockchain, we don't need any government, we don't need any structures, it'll all take care of itself and, and the world will, will work on its own. A blockchain is really a decentralized ledger, uh, you know, in, in the decentralized form. It can also be a centralized ledger. Let's be careful about putting too much uh, sort of uh, ambition and hope on just this. Yes, there can be applications, uh, you know, for democracy. I've heard people talk about that. I'd like to see them. But I think a lot of democracy is about engaging with people, debating, arguing, persuading. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. It can't be all decentralized to, uh, to a technical process. Now, what you may have in mind is the technical process sort of being part of the persuasion, uh, and, and by all means, we should use every means we can, while recognizing that technology sometimes uh, works in perverse ways, so we have to be careful about that. Um, I'm gonna read out a question from one of our um, Zoom participants. What sort of change, if any, in the current affirmative action policies are required for boosting empowerment of marginalized communities? Well, I think that, uh, I would focus much more on uh, enabling capability building uh, as opposed to uh, focusing on, on outcomes, that is, you know, uh, job reservation and so on. Now, again, from what I said, I think job reservation has a place for those who aren't networked, who don't have any, uh, but I think once that is taken care of, focus much more on giving people access to a sound education and an ability and, you know, sound healthcare, uh, early childhood, uh, you know, learning, all that stuff seems to be more, we should focus on public goods. The problem is focusing on public goods and making a change thereby takes a long time. The political incentive is to promise jobs. There's only so much we can promise in terms of jobs. As I said, we already have limited jobs. How much are we going to promise of the existing jobs? Uh, instead, uh, I, I think we need to put far more emphasis on the, on the capabilities. Uh, last point. Uh, there is a big question about when we remove the affirmative action, right? And, and I think the Supreme Court has it reasonably right that once you are part of the network, once uh, you know your parents are well to do and can help you, uh, you know you should not have access to affirmative action except in one case, if even then you're still subject to social discrimination. So so long as you know somebody is considered in the old uh, language untouchable, uh, I think we need to remedy that, and so. I think uh, a certain amount of affirmative action for social disability is also warranted. It's not just economic disability. But hopefully over time, as you gain economic status, the social vanishes into the dustbin of history. And so we can, we can look forward from there. But, but that's one place where I would say uh, it's not just the fact that you've attained the so-called creamy layer that stops your affirmative action it should continue when you have social discrimination. Thank you. Can we take the last two questions, maybe? Yeah, gentlemen right here. Yeah. Extremely I'm brief. Brief. I'm a commissioner and we are a We have a free trade agreement between the uh, UK and uh, India. Uh, what's the benefit to India more than UK? Can you explain this? I, I don't know much about the free trade agreement, so I'm, I will, we don't defer. have one, that's the whole point. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, we hope to have we one by Diwali. One, yeah. yeah, we hope to have one. Well, I'll let uh, <laughs> my uh, esteemed panelists opine on it. Uh, I, I can opine on a lot, but not on something I don't know anything about. Okay, then yeah, in, in all fairness, if you have a question yes. for Professor Rajan, yes. then go for it, but indeed yes. there is no free trade agreement. Um, in the back, blue sweater, yes please. Hello, my name is Lux and uh, I'm really honored to sit here. Uh, my 
question is, uh, recent interest rate rise has made exodus in foreign investment. Uh, so does this small change help made Indian investments unattractive? Uh, will it hamper the growth of Indian economy in long term? And if yes, how much? <laughs> Uh, I haven't done the calculations yet. <laughs> uh, uh, look, uh, the interest rate rise across the world uh, is obviously in response to inflation, and typically uh, it, it hurts uh, uh, emerging markets uh, in the following sense that uh, typically low interest rates in the industrial world push capital to the emerging markets. Uh, reduce the cost of capital there, allows more investment if need be. Um, and the reverse happens when interest rates rise. We've seen, for example, portfolio outflows of, out of India uh, over the last year, 30 billion and counting. So um, it certainly doesn't help the Indian economy, but it's, it has to be borne. It is a natural fact that interest rates come down and they go up. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we have, to some extent, uh, increased uh, the buffers in our economy with a large uh, holding of reserves. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will contain inflation in India and not make India unattractive. Hopefully, uh, you know, there will be uh, a reasonable amount of depreciation in the rupee with the appreciation of the dollar, but it will not get excessive. All this will enable us to withstand uh, what is happening without without serious damage. Uh, but it's a fact of life. Interest rates go up, interest rates come down, and now's the up phase, and we've got to bear it and live with it. This is the last question. Please. Uh, Professor Rajan, thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, I'm an academic who works in engineering and development and basic services and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the thing I worry about is that the millions of households who do not have access to water, sanitation, electricity, clean cooking, very basic services. Uh, what more could be done on that front? So uh, that's a great question. And, and you know, I mean, implicit in my point about delivery of education, healthcare, and other services is a sense that we need to change the way that these are acquired by the public. It can't be, you know, this is a gift from the government. And in, over time, every government sort of wants to treat it as this is a gift from us. Uh, the picture of the state chief minister or the prime minister on every such, such. <laughs> it is not a gift. It is something the public, which is paying taxes, uh, you know, needs and should be delivered well. And that's why I think the governance process needs to be much more transparent and more decentralized. Now, immediately when you say decentralization, people have in mind, oh, this will be captured by the elites locally, or uh, there will be a lot of corruption. I mean, those are possibilities. We have new technologies which can deal with some of that. For example, transparency can be enhanced through better information, uh, which, you know, uh, internet is a big enabler there. But also we must ask, is this worse than what is currently happening, where you have no power, and that teacher who's employed by the state government never shows up in the village because uh, that teacher is paid by the, by the state government in the capital and has their own uh, connections and their own arrangements there. What if they were paid by the local panchayat? Even if the local panchayat is captured by the local elite, you can still go to the local elite and say, what is happening? They don't show up. And your child is going to the same school uh, or your, your brother's child is going to the same school. So, so my sense is, uh, you know, people having more power uh, over government is part of the answer for the poor quality of public services. And that means better information, better protection from arbitrary arrest and so on, uh, the right to criticize, but also actual power. All right, then. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rajan, for coming and giving this amazing <laughs> round off with a couple of things. So I, I just want to remind us all of some of the things you said at the end. Uh, you talked about three important things, increasing people's capability and empowering them to do more, 
we need a learning, adaptable government that's decentralized, uh, that trusts our people. I really like that, a non-paternalistic approach of the government, and experimentation in policy making. I mean, the phrase I love, I teach entrepreneurship here, is the entrepreneurial policy maker who has a market feedback loop, much like entrepreneurs do. So it, it would be great to have that. And one of the things you said was about Danny Roderick, about the process from moving to, from agriculture to services. Now, one of the papers I was reading of Danny Roderick very recently said, it is not surprising that, that there are only a few liberal democracies, but that there are any at all. And going back to how you started, where you said, I'm going to focus on the economic imperative for having uh, liberal democracies, but let's not forget that there is indeed a moral imperative too, and that we need an Indian path and to draw on our historical culture of uh, tolerance and criticism and so on. So let's keep that in mind. And Sunil reminded us that he's prescient. So you know, let's keep that in mind as well. So hopefully this will work for India and this is the Indian part. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much as well for coming. If, if I can request everybody to please use the gates at the, the door at the back uh, to exit, that would be great.